Hi, my name is Jerome Bradford, and this is my music journal, where we explore music album by album. Just jump right into it. Hello, welcome to another episode of Jerome's Music Journal. Uh, we are shooting this one from my apartment via Zoom. Today, we're going to look at the album In Utero by Nirvana. It's a really good album. Actually, one of my favorite albums from my teenage years. The thing that makes this album so important, this album actually has some prehistory, like a lot of albums do. This came after Nevermind. Nevermind was this huge album that no one expected to get big. Even the people from Sub Pop didn't expect Nirvana to be that huge band. They thought it would be Mud Honey. The album was well received. Um, so as soon as that Smells Like Teen Spirit aired on MTV, Nirvana gained hundreds and thousands of fans. Well, they weren't exactly super happy with the results of that. Uh, Nirvana was a very political band in some ways. They were a feminist band and often fought for, um, I guess you could say, the underdogs of society. Uh, but when Nirvana hit the mainstream, a lot of people came in and really didn't get the message. So because of that, this album is different. And the way this album sounded differently is because of that reaction to the MTV buzz. So um, you had you had this widely popular band, and if you've ever listened to Nevermind by Nirvana, you know that it's there's pop very buried underneath that buzz. It's first chorus first. There's pop buried under there. They often play with pop melodies. Um, this album, they kind of took all that and just turned it on its head. Um, so even the producer they sought out, who was Steve Albany, who is a legend in the noise scene. Uh, he played in a band called Big Black and they made really abrasive music. Uh, was that cross between punk and any rock? Uh, just abrasive. That That's the best word for I can't really even describe it. So uh, check out Big Black as well. You know, that'll give you some context to the person that was producing this album. One way that this album is different is the fact that Albany refused to double track Cobain's voice. He actually just recorded his voice in the kitchen, so it sounds very resonant. Even his vocal pattern um, is very, overtakes the band a lot. There's almost this screaming as opposed to just, and you can kind of hear the agony and the screams as well, uh, as well as his frustration too. A lot of that bleeds out. Um, one thing, too, that makes this album really different, I feel like there's all types of tracks on this album. There's some acoustic tracks. There's uh, there's a distorted pop tracks. Uh, lyrical content is different. So I didn't want to get into some lyrical content here. I'm taking notes. There's even some self-deprivation on a... Uh, the song Francis Farmer. Um, you know, there's there's playing with pop culture where if you know the story of that, that's about a famous actress who actually did go uh, a bit crazy for a while and she was found, found outside in someone's home. So there's that. There's just these weird song titles too, which at the time, um, was kind of different. A lot of bands weren't doing very long, long song titles or anything. So Nirvana was to set their self apart for Millie Grunge fans in that aspect. I'll even say with this album, they wanted to kind of remove that whole grunge pop aesthetic as well too. Uh, 
not necessarily I don't think they had liked the band they had become. They thought it was just going to be really different. So I'm looking at notes here. It's always good to take notes whenever you're deep diving like this. Two of the songs that I think really uh, make a great example of how this album is different, how the guitars are aggressive and it's screaming is Tourette's and Radio Friendly Unit Shifter. Uh, those songs, they're fast, they're loud, and Kurt Cobain's vocals are very uh, antagonizing in some way. So there's no, almost no softness to his vocals and the pace is just super fast. So, you know, if you look at a lot of grunge bands at that time, um, I actually, was it more some of their things, you know, I would can into more like uh, art punk band or even something you were hearing. Um, noise rock so very very different album um let's get into some of the self-deprecation we have here so uh in serve the servants kurt cobain sings teenage angst have paid off well now i'm bored and old you know so now what they were dealing with they were dealing with rock star angst um everything before never mind could be put in the view of Teenage Yanks because they weren't big. They had an exploded upon the scene. Once you get that big, uh, big, excuse me, big, a lot of things change, especially for a band that really likes to keep their fan base small and really tight. Um, you feel like things are out of your control. You have fans that maybe you didn't want, you know. The song Rape Me was actually kind of... Uh, um, song that was a feminist song the message of that song was about how the you know a person won't be destroyed by the rape they'll still live from that experience uh, but often Kurt Cobain said that a lot of later fans just seem like frat boys who you know he would not want to hang out with or who you know he didn't he didn't really have a good image of them you know, because as he says, he's ran into frat boys before in his youth. And, you know, he had had female friends that were sexually assaulted by a frat boys. So, you know, and then this is also them bringing a lot of their politics into their album. Uh, a lot of grunge fans wasn't necessarily about politics. It was more about you know, teenage feelings or teenage angst. So they were also also breaking away from grunge bands in that aspect, you know. Uh, I want to talk about the cover art lastly. I find this to be in my top 10 uh, album covers. If you've ever seen it, I have a picture here so I can show you guys, hopefully. And I don't think, nope, that is not going to show up well. We'll just go and look up the cover of Nirvana's In Utero, and you can see, you can see the cover art. It looks like, oh, I don't know exactly. Anyway, it's just really great. Just check it out. Uh, that cover art was very good and well done. Um, so in some ways, that was them breaking from uh, mainstream album art. Uh, you know, this was a very detailed, intricate cover. Uh, the band was in on the front of the cover. You know, they have not been on some of their album covers before, but this was a very detailed art cover. So, and for me, that speaks a lot too, because very beautiful to look at and when you do something like that when others aren't doing uh you could say pretty 
album covers like that. It does in some way go against the mainstream. So lastly, I want to look at the lasting legacy of this record. One reason that I find this record so impactful and so great is a wide array of it. There's actually a lot of things you can talk about on this record. I can talk about this all day. There's just so much stuff that went on this re- with this record uh, and that bled into this record. You know, uh, Kurt Cobain's, you know, was really depressed at this time. A lot of people said all apologies was kind of his way of bowing out. We all know, unfortunately, he took his life later down the line, but there's just so much. I just wanted to kind of keep this one short. Going solo today, don't really have a guest, so, uh, but they're with me in spirit. So, you know, all the people that have guested before, Nate, Austin, Stephanie. So, yeah, I think for me, the lasting impact of this record will really be how how varied a sound can be on an album. Uh, You know, you go from you actually go from those two songs I mentioned earlier, Radio Friendly Unit Shifter and Tourette's into All Apologies, which is their acoustic song. And it's just kind of jarring but it works it's really cool you know uh for me i don't think there's a bad song on this album i often said on this show that there are some albums you can play uh front to back and not skip this is one of those albums you should just let play all the way through not skip it leave it alone um especially Especially if you want to get a good sense of where the band's head would uh, host MTV fame. Uh, you really do. Uh, standout tracks for me are Serve the Servants. I like the, you know, uh, self deprecating humor of it. Uh, Frances Farmer will have her Revenge on Seattle. Love that song. I also kind of love that it's based on a true story and the title to me is just cool. Like That's a really cool title. And of course, I've talked about these two songs before, Radio Friendly Unit Shifter and Tourette's, just because they are so jarring. They're fast, they're aggressive. Vocals just overtake the track, uh, you know, You feel like he's screaming at you. He's screaming like all of his pain and frustration with personal stuff and the fame thing. So, so, well, this was a short one, but thank you guys for watching Jerome's Music Journal. Have a good day.